does it from a place where there is a community. And I think even the few days that we've been in uh, Jeffreys Bay, we've encountered people meeting them, and uh, they would basically rehearse some of what is happening here on a Sunday morning, what's happening here, you know, during uh, doing community here with uh, Victory uh, Church. And I think for me, I just want to encourage you. So uh, what is happening here this morning when we're gathering here, it's a celebration. But uh, God wants what is happening here, He wants that to be taken out and to multiply. And we've already been encouraged by what God is doing here. And so I'm just so thrilled this morning just to uh, bring a little uh, impartation this morning just to continue what God is doing here. So this morning, I want to speak about discipleship going deeper because, you know, I'm from YWAM, and uh, the thing that YWAM is best known for is its discipleship training school, the DTS. And of course, some of you uh, who are in the audience have done the DTS uh, others, you have uh, met people that have been involved in YWAM, but that's the, you know, the gateway, that's the door into YWAM, is the discipleship training school. And I believe that, especially the season that we are in and what God is doing in the world, God wants to take us deeper. And so even though I am uh, very much uh, at the heart of a missions movement and what God is doing around the earth, why I'm operating in 190 countries, training about a quarter million uh, people that's going through his training programs and short-term programs, uh, you know, and we're seeing God doing phenomenal things. But I just realized that at the, at the heart of the Great Commission is not so much evangelism, even though we have to evangelize. Evangelism is part of discipleship. And the command that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, 19, and 20, all power and authority has been given unto me. Now you go. He's delegating that authority. Now you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And lo, I will be with you until the, the, the end of this age. And so when you look at that uh, portion of Scripture, especially in verse 19, the command there is not to go. Jesus assumed that as he has journeyed with his disciples for three and a half years, that they would get it, that they will go, that they will share what he has imparted to them. So, you know, if you read the Greek, you would actually read it in a way, as you go. Make disciples. So the command really is in making disciples. And that is how we are going to reach the world for Christ. That is what Jesus always had in his mind. That's why he spent the time there with his apprentices, with his disciples, these vocational um, young people that he called to join him on a journey. It's actually fascinating that when you study, um, you know, Judaism, you find that they had a separation when it comes to education. They had the whole, uh, you know, part of wisdom, you know, the, the sages, you know, the rabbis, those who were part of knowledge. And then you had the craftsmen, you had the vocational workers, like the fishermen, the carpenters. Now, never in the history of Judaism did you have a craftsman actually standing up in the temple and opening the scroll and start teaching. And uh, it's, it's, it's what happened in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus basically gave his manifesto quoting from Isaiah chapter 61. And the people, they were amazed, and they said, wasn't he, isn't he the son of Joseph? Isn't he a carpenter? But that word for carpenter actually is handyman. Isn't he this handyman, the son of Joseph and Mary? And we can see how these two are coming together. You know, where you had the wisdom of God that was deposited in him. But Jesus really coming from this rural area in Galilee, um, you know, working as a craftsman, working as a carpenter, and inviting mainly fishermen to come and join him on this journey. And so like we say, as Pastor Louis reminded us this morning, for 2,000 years, you know, people have tried to stop the church. But I want to say this morning, Jesus is saying, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The kingdom of God is implacable. The kingdom of God is advancing. In some of the most unlikely places, God is doing something incredible. And that is what it is all about. So I'm going to give you a few points this morning. 
But, uh, you know, I've been involved with YWAM now for the last 36 years. I came as an 18-year-old in 1986. I thought I was going to stay for six months. That's how they trick you in victory gap year. <laughs> they say, just give 11 months of the year for God. 11 months, you know, uh, of your life for God. And then, of course, we know what God does in the midst of that. So, I mean, you know, this is my story, but I love even, you know, 36 years later, I love to hang out with, with young people because I believe that, you know, as we see these young people, as Jesus saw these fishermen, he saw potential, potential that brings you to that place of purpose. It gives you purpose because especially when somebody speaks potential, over you, when somebody believed in you, like somebody, uh, a priest in Russia was approached by an atheist, you know, back in communism, and said to the priest, I don't believe in God. And the priest said, that's okay if you don't believe in God, but I want to tell you, God believes in you. And this is this morning, even if you don't believe in God or God's promises, I want to say to you this morning, God believes in you, and God believes in those promises that he has given you. And we see that even with the covenant that he made with Abraham. Abraham did not keep his part of the covenant. You know, when uh, they, um, you know, when they butchered the birds, and, and so in the ancient uh, time, they would walk in the form of an eighth. You know, it's like an unbroken kind of a, um, you know, structure, you know, as you walk through, you know, the, the sacrifice. And so what happened, you know, Abraham was trying to keep, you know, the vultures away, and then he fell asleep. And so, of course, God was walking through that sacrifice. God is keeping his part of the covenant, even though Abraham didn't keep his part. And so we are really serving a covenant-keeping God. The things that God has deposited into your life, the promises God has given you, even though in your own understanding it's not how it should have worked out or has worked out, I want to say to you at the end of the day, when God brings you to the place of what we read this morning from Revelation, giving you throne room perspective that kingdoms will come and kingdoms will go but our God reigns the kingdoms of the earth will become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ because that is the throne room perspective that John is inviting us into and so I believe that as we build generationally and I think this is even what is happening in a big part of the body of Christ even within YWAM our founder, Lauren Cunningham, he is now 86 years old. And so, uh, you know, really it's getting into his, into his afterglow years with this legacy that is following him. And pretty much he's just, you know, sitting in Hawaii. Leaders are flying in from all over the world. One of our other leaders, Joy Dawson, you know, she wrote the book, Intimate Friendship with God, really a pioneer that gave birth to a lot of the modern prayer movements like the 24-7 with Mike Bickle. He's sharing that it was, um, you know, it was him listening to a cassette. Do you guys remember what a cassette is? I'm not talking about the Victory Gap Year students. I'm talking about people that are from my generation. You know, he was listening to a cassette and he was taking notes from a cassette of Joy Dawson on prayer and intercession. And it was those notes that he recovered a couple of years later that birthed a whole prayer movement that has gone around the world. She is now 97 years old. And so you've got people flying in like Bill Johnson and others just sitting at her feet and, uh, you know, just gaining, you know, some uh, insight and wisdom from her. But we in the season in the church, you know, that, um, you know, there's a shift coming like, you know, Pastor Louis has shared and Diana has just shared with us this morning. But I believe it is to do with this whole multi-generational thing that God is building. And it has to happen in the context of discipleship. It has to happen in the context of community. It has to happen in the context where we are rubbing shoulders with each other, where we are walking through some of the challenges and the mess together. Because at the end of the day, that is really where we get our authority from. It's the longevity. It's the faithfulness of God, and as we are, are, are staying the course, as we are approaching things with grit and with steadfastness and with staying power, and not just when things get difficult, you know, we just go off and we just join another community, or, you know, we are just upset with, you know, somebody, uh, and then, uh, you know, we're taking our own course. But it's in these multi-generational communities where there's no place for personal ego, where there's no place for building our own kingdom, because 
we're not just thinking short term. We're not just thinking about our generation, but we are looking at multi-generations. And even some of the people, when we were in victory, they were kids. Now we are meeting them at Global, and they said, you look familiar. I was five years old when you were in Jeffreys Bay, and now I'm a maths teacher. I mean, that's not always so encouraging because then you realize, you know, you are moving on with age. But I mean, that is what is happening, you know? But it's this multi-generational uh, community that happens in the context of discipleship. I believe that is really at the heart of why the church has been sustained through different periods, through different wars. I have just been in Cairo with Diana, and I went to visit a church. It's called the Rock Church. It is in a cave. It's the largest church in the Middle East. It's a 20,000-seater church in a Muslim nation. And I was standing in that church, and I heard the story of a young priest in 1974 who was walking around in the garbage dump. So that's the place in Cairo where they recycle the garbage. And mainly the Coptic Christians from the south, they would move into Egypt they would take on this menial task. They would separate the garbage. And so a whole community was built on that mountain. And so a priest one day, as a young priest, went to that particular area. And as he was walking in garbage city, so we, you know, we drove, um, got stuck in two hours of a traffic jam that would normally, I think we could have walked and it took, would have taken us 10 minutes or 15 or maybe half an hour. But we were stuck, you know, uh, in that uh, garbage city with all the trucks with the garbage going back and forth. And he was in that place. And as he was there visiting, you know, some of his uh, congregation, a little piece of scripture from the garbage blew towards him and landed at his feet. And that piece of scripture confirmed his calling that God wants to do something in the city. And out of that very, very, very powerful encounter he had with the word of God, a scripture coming out of the garbage that talks about, you know, there will be laughter in the city, that, uh, you know, your city will not be called desolate. Out of that place, he started this church that today is a thriving church where people come in together and pray. And it's a incredible testimony around the world. God is something doing, God is doing something amazing around the face of the earth, and for us to be a part of that, even in the times when we go through some of our greatest challenges. But anyway, you know, we just started our new student intake in January of this year, and like I always like to hang out on orientation day. The students get orientated, they fly in from around the world, like, you know, victory gap year, and, and so year, you know, they would have their, their uh, <clears throat> you know, they would be orientated about the base, about Musenberg, life in South Africa, and so forth. And in the afternoon, I like to hang out, you know, with those young people. And so I was sitting there in our cafe, and um, a young man came to sit next to me, and so I started chatting with him. He just finished, he's from England, he just finished his A-levels, 19, 20 years old. And I introduced myself to him, and I said, my name is Edwin. He said, oh, my name is George. But he didn't know who I was. He had no clue. He just arrived the previous day. So then I asked him the question, which I asked for a lot of, you know, to a lot of students. I said, George, I said, what do you miss from England? He said, he paused for a moment, and then he said, he said, uh, do you really want to know what I miss? I said, no, I would like to know what you miss. I thought maybe it's English breakfast tea or Earl Grey or, you know, uh, uh, those, um, what do you call those, those, those cookies, you know, with a chocolate on one side, digestive. So I thought this is what he's going to be missing. He paused for a moment. He looked at me. He said, do you really want to know, Edwin? I said, sure, no, I want to know. He said, what I miss is I miss my Cuban cigars and my whiskey. <laughs> now, he is just starting his DTS. And then he looked at me intently, and he said, Edwin, if you're going to do something in life, now, I love it when young people start to teach us older people. <laughs> now, you know, teenagers, you know, they think they know how the world turns. They would tell you exactly. They've just lived for 16 years, and I've lived for 56 years, 55 years, or whatever. Anyway, so George is telling me with this stone, he said, Edwin, let me tell you something. If you're going to do something, you have to do it well. 
So I was just laughing and we went on. And then the Wednesday I saw him and I said, George, how are you doing? And then he was walking around with his head down. I said, what has happened to you? He said, Edwin, I just heard over the weekend on Saturday that you were the director of YWAM. And I have just told you, <laughs> I have just told you that my mother was the one who filled in my application form, that I didn't want to be here, that I'm missing my whiskey and that I'm missing my cigars. But I had a heart after God, but I told my parents and I said to them, if I'm going to come to why my biggest fear is, is that I'm going to become charismatic and it's going to be all your fault. And they keep encouraging him to go to YWAM. He said, Tuesday, I went to prayer with the community. And he said, as I prayed with Dylan, one of our young staff members, he said, as I prayed with Dylan, he said, Edwin, I don't know what happened, but I just started to weep and to weep and to weep and to weep. And God took hold of my life. And he said, the biggest thing that I feared I have become, I am now a charismatic. Now, George has got a good relationship with his parents, so he is texting back and forth with his parents, telling them what is happening. He said, it's all your fault. I've become a charismatic. Two weeks later, his parents were in Cape Town because they're one of the most high-powered couples, you know, lawyers. You know, they're dealing, you know, with deals that amounts to billions of dollars. And so they wanted to come and check out YWAM because they had no idea who YWAM was, they just heard from a friend, it would be good for George to go to YWAM. And so, last week, these parents were in town. Now, that's the time when you want to keep these parents away from your Sunday morning service, especially when you're going to be having a lot of charismatic people raising hands and singing prophetically. So, he said, Edwin, my mother wants to sit in, in our class on Monday morning, but the theme of this week is spiritual warfare. <laughs> I mean, this is just how it works. It's spiritual warfare. I said, don't worry, George, I've got a strategy. I'm gonna take your mom and dad for breakfast on Monday morning. Anyway, long story short, I'm sitting there with his parents. With tears in their eyes, they are speaking about how God is changing the life of their child. That it's not just about coming to Christ, which is great, it's evangelism, this is fantastic. But the way I like to compare it is that evangelism is like the wedding and marriage is like discipleship. How many of you can relate to that? Now we celebrate the wedding, we have our friends, we have the witnesses, but then there are times when you wake up next to your spouse and you realize, but I married a different person. Don't raise your hand, just smile at me. And that doesn't only happen once, that, whole, that happens several times. Because your spouse that you have married or the girlfriend have changed so much that it's like a new spouse. And especially when your spouse, when you have a fight, I'm talking about, you know, an argument and it gets heated, and then your spouse is reminding you of the teachings from Pastor Louis while you were living in Jeffreys Bay. That really upsets me. <laughs> but friends, this is in doing life together. It is when God calls us. It's when God sees potential. It is when God looks at that young person, God looks at that young, um, you know, man, God looks at that young woman, and, and in the same way that Jesus called Simon Peter in John chapter 1 verse 42, a very insecure young man, and Jesus said, you are Simon, son of John, but you will be called Peter. And what is amazing is that we see here that Jesus believed in the, in the potential of his disciples. He took the weak world, unstable, fearful, quick-talking, backstabber Simon Peter, who received the promise from Jesus that he was a rock and that the church will be built and that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Doesn't that give you hope? When I sat in school, and I had some learning disabilities, and I had problems with my speech. And I will never forget, coming from the rural area of Mossel Bay, my teacher, in the middle of class, she came to me, and then she drew a cow on my face because I was from the rural community, and in front of the whole class, she was shaming me, and she said, you are a cow. 
To make a long story short, today, this teacher is one of my greatest supporters and one of the people who are praying for me as God is taking his gospel through me around the world. It doesn't matter what people are saying about you. When God connects your potential with your calling, that gives you a sense of purpose. And when you have that purpose, no devil in hell will be able to stop what God has invested in you. And I remember as I, as I sat with God, you know, as a young man, and I asked God, God, what do you have for my life? God said, I'm raising you up to teach nations, to disciple all nations. Just the other day, I spoke to a young man who is now training all the pastors of the Ethiopian church. It's one of the oldest churches in Africa. And somehow they've got a whole network of churches in South Africa. And he is really an apostle to the Khorsas. He's an apostle, you know, to all these, all these uh, you know, tribes, uh, you know, around the Eastern Cape. But now God is giving him influence into Africa. And I remember as I said with this young man, I will never forget it. We were here in Jeffreys Bay in Palsaris. And we went to the shack. It wasn't the shack. It was worse than a shack. It was like a chicken coop. He was sitting there and he put all his belongings in a pep store's plastic bag and he brought it to youth with a mission and we look at him. His name is Kaya Kaya Letu and today he's our base leader in East London. He's an apostle. God is doing incredible things through his life. But this happened here because God saw him. God didn't just see him, God noticed him, God called him, God touched him, and today this young man is doing incredible things around the world. The second thing that I want to leave with you this morning is not only potential that will give us a sense of purpose, but relationship, relationship that forms character. Discipleship, friends, what I want to say to you, it cannot happen outside of community. How many of you know it is easy to be sanctified when you're by yourself? As ek by myself is, as ek die heiligste persoon. For all is the battle music and the achtergrond spiel, when the battle music is playing in the background, and it is an anointed moment, and I feel like I'm at my holiest, and then when I walk out of my, uh, out of my prayer room, and then I have to encounter people. I tell you, I love YWAM, if it was not for the people. <laughs> I mean, I love church, if it was not for the people. But the, let me tell you, this is how God has set up this thing. That discipleship, friends, this whole journey, what Paul terms godliness, that's his phrase. But the most clearest way we find it in the Gospels, where in Luke chapter 6, verse 40, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, a student is not above his teacher, but anyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. So what Jesus is saying the goal for discipleship, yes, Paul is using the term godliness. But what Jesus is saying, the goal of discipleship is to be like me. It's Christ-likeness. It's Christ-likeness. And that's why, that is why when we don't have a church that is discipled, then we will have, again, what we've had in Africa in the 20th century, one of the biggest genocides where Christians were fighting against Christians. I think we somehow forgot a little bit our history in South Africa. It was people who read the same Bible who were opposing each other. Can I just get an amen? If there is a lack of discipleship, friends, then this is what is happening where you have Christian fighting Christian. And I believe that discipleship is happening in the context of community. That's why Jesus called the disciples to him. But he also called them into a group. I will never forget it when I joined YWAM in 1986, in the middle of an apartheid. First time that I was sharing a room with a white person. We were 17 in a room. We are looking who's going to go to bed first. But it was in that place where God changed my life. It's in that place where I saw people from a totally different perspective. It was in community where we had our fights. I'm not trying to tell you it was easy. No, we had our challenges. But it was in that place, as iron sharpened iron, so a man sharpens another man, because it's in community where we grow. 
It's in community that we get healed. It's in community that we are celebrating. And it's in community that we are coming around to the Lord's table and we do mission together. It happens in community, no other place. The authenticity of the gospel and the witness of the gospel is not in how we go along, but it is in how we get along. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one or another. And the way that it manifests, it's in these incredible relationships that are so unlikely where I am having a house church leader that is a farmer. I've got a pastor that is a craftsman and a businessman and an entrepreneur. It's in these relationships that God has been shaping me some of the best years, as Diana said. We've spent here in Jeffreys Bay because God always worked in the context of place. That's why we have got Jerusalem. That is why we have got the Antioch. That is why in church history, we've got the Alexandria. It's in those places where God worked. The, the, the Constantinople's where we had all these creeds as the church were dealing with all kinds of theology. It happened in relationship. Let me give you the last point. Power that brings multiplication. Go and make disciples of all nations. Acts chapter one, verse eight. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. Discipleship has to happen, friends, in the context of the Holy Spirit. You need to understand that we've got three kinds of callings. Number one, we've got our highest calling. That is our relationship with God. Secondly, we've got our common calling. That is the Word of God. Even if you are a lawyer, if you're a Christian, it says do not give false testimony. The same for the Christian banker. Do not steal. It's the same thing. It's our common calling. Doesn't matter who you are. So we've got our highest calling. We've got our common calling. Thirdly, we've got our specific calling, and that has got to do with the leading of the Holy Spirit. That is why I'm in YWAM. Pastor Louis is in Church of the Nations in Cotton. So we are all walking together, but we've got our specific callings, and that's where the Holy Spirit leads us. And so discipleship doesn't only happen in the context of God calling us, giving us purpose, not only in community, but it is also where the Holy Spirit needs to lead us because I believe that is where the multiplication happens. When the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples in Acts chapter 2, what happened? Peter preached, and how many got saved? 3,000. And they were meeting from house to house, and God added to their number. I had a young man who came to our DTS in 1997 in Musenberg. He's from Madagascar. And we've lost touch with him. I've heard about his name and what he's doing. And so uh, he went back to Madagascar and he started planting churches. And so about three years ago, he was in uh, uh, Southern California at the church of Rick Warren, the guy who wrote the book, The Purpose Driven Life. And he's speaking there with Lauren Cunningham. And as he came down the stage, he asked Lauren, he said, Lauren, can I please take a selfie with you? And Lauren said, sure. And then Dina, my friend, he said, Lauren, I'm also a YWAMer. And then he told Lauren the story, and that's why they invited him to this conference in uh, Southern California. He said, I have just planted my 10,000th church. A young guy who came through, nobody knew who he was, but in that place where somebody saw his potential, invested in his life, having intentional relationship with him in community, the Holy Spirit coming upon his life, and this is what God is doing in the nations of the earth. This afternoon, I'm having a meeting with a young man from Benin. His wife, Mariella, is from Burkina Faso. They've been working in Madagascar for many years. They have just uh, relocated to South Africa about five years ago, and now they are here in Jeffreys Bay to do their debriefing. Guys, if you don't know what God is doing in J-Bay, then your eyes must be shut, and it takes somebody from the outside to come and tell you that God is doing something amazing in the small place. I mean... 
So what is happening is that he is getting debriefing because he's returning to Madagascar because we've been praying for the last 10 years for a medical ship for Madagascar. And I was on a call with somebody from Switzerland and they asked me, they said, Edwin, have you ever considered a ship for Madagascar, for YWAM? And I said, we've been praying for it for 10 years. And while they chatting to me online, on Messenger, she said to me from Switzerland, she said, oh my goodness, I think we just got the money for the ship. Make a long story short, uh, long story short, the ship is being refitted now in the south of England and it's sailing in the next two months as a hospital ship to work along the coast of Madagascar and he's going back there to facilitate what God wants to do. God is doing something. And he's right here in this village. Can anything good comes out of Nazareth? And I believe that we are at this place where we are contending for God's purposes, for God's destiny of what God is doing. And it comes through longevity. It comes through relationship. It comes through community. It is asking each other those hard questions. Have intentional relationship. Jesus said to his disciples, you know, you are my servants, but I have called you friends. Because friends, servants don't know the things about their master, the inner workings, but I have called you friends. It's in that relational dynamic. And I believe this morning, this is a holy moment, and I don't want to take too much of your time, that this spirit is not just manifesting in the church because I believe the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That this thing that God is wanting to do when it comes to purpose, when it comes to intentional relationships and building community where God can grow us and God can disciple us. When it comes to the empowering of the Holy Spirit, I believe that it is gonna happen over the whole spectrum of what God has called us to. God didn't start a zoo in Genesis chapter one and two and three and just to keep us there so that we can enjoy a nice garden so that we can enjoy all the animals and treat it like a zoo the man that God gave Adam and Eve he said to them now you have to go and you have to fill the earth multiply and fill the earth that is God's mandate for us 